You know that sound. It means it's time for Running Out the Clock with your host, me. Just it's me. I'm I'm Joseph Craven. I'm hosting. I'm here with Keith. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Cool. That's it. It's over. You, All right. Thank you guys goodbye, for tuning everybody. in to our, to our Kentucky preview. This has been it for us. Um, yeah, here. We- <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> basically what the preview is going to be. So I don't know. This is going to be an interesting one. I, I find Kentucky to be one of the more interesting teams in the conference uh, this season. And I'll explain why after this commercial break. Just kidding. Anyway, welcome to Running Out the Clock. As mentioned, I'm your friend Joseph Craven, and I am joined by Keith Big Boss Harkins on the eve of the eve of the eve of his wedding. Oh, yeah. Is that right? It is Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. Is that the right amount of eves? I think yeah, that's right. That, that eve of the eve of the Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. yeah, it seems right. Even if it's wrong, it's not wrong. <laughs> Um, we're, we're going to roll with it regardless, mm-hmm. but we are here to discuss the Kentucky Wildcats. Um, the surprise smash hit team of the 2018 season, um, a team that w- won 10 games, a team that had five conference victories, a team that had by all accounts, probably like the best uh performance the best season in program history probably like jumped in the top 25 in week five and never once fell out of it again including those victories uh against in-state rival louisville uh including a bowl victory against number 13 penn state i mean just a heck of a season for kentucky keith if you're going to sum up last season for the wildcats i mean how would you rate that uh, you can just insert the uh, sound file of the uh, home improvement guy. Um, you know, the. Oh, I was going to say, Heidi Ho, good neighbor. Yeah, that one. Yeah, where yeah. where Wilson just looks confused from the very top of the fence board. Tyler um, Wilson. Tyler Wilson. Yes. Terry Wilson. Um, <laughs> no, they had they had they had a very surprising uh, year. Um of course, you know, uh, kind of starting off beating Florida for the first time in uh, approximately a billion years. Yep. Um, and so that that was kind of that moment where you're like, is Florida bad? Is Kentucky good? Turns out you get one yes to those two questions. And, and it was to Kentucky good because they were good last year. Um, yeah. Oddly enough, you know, like we have our kind of annual joke about, oh, well, Kentucky always starts out like five and oh, and then right. And then they implode on themselves like a dying star. Yep. Um, this but, was this was their time to not do that. Yeah. Um, we we actually kind of made that joke again last year because they lost to Texas A&M in the sixth game. So right. like, right, here it is. And then they only lost two more games the rest of the year. So um yeah, one of those I, I, being to a very good Georgia team. Yeah, yeah. And, and and the like, other one being very weird. Yeah, yeah, and and of course, Georgia was a uh, fake punt away from beating Alabama in the SC championship game. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Stupid fake punt. I, I am I am always going to bring up the fact that for two years in a row now, Georgia has uh, had a chance to win the SEC and uh, just tied it up very nicely and handed it to Alabama. And then just friggin' doesn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, but, but yeah, so Kentucky, very surprising last year. Uh, good for them. Good for their fans. They, they've been waiting for this for a very long time. Um, I know you have a good friend that's a huge Kentucky fan. Um, and I know that he kind of jokes around with you about like, you know, if we win five or six games as a football program, we're okay with that. Yeah. Yeah, but it's true, you know, like their their expectations are let's, you know, try to get bowl eligible, you know, Mm -hmm. and let's try to hold on to that on a consistent basis. If we just, you know, if Kentucky has consistency, that's what they want out of a football program. But this was really a testament to what Mark Stoops has been doing. Um, I mean, even in his tenure um, as the, the Kentucky head coach, 
since he took over in 2014, you know, they've been on the cusp of uh, doing really well. In fact, they've honestly been kind of a model of consistency since he took over Mm -hmm. Um, 2013. I mean, sorry, only two victories his first season there, but five and seven, five and seven the next two years, and then seven to six, seven to six, the next two years. And then last year was that 10 win and finally got that bowl victory. In fact, if they had won their bowl games, they went to in 2016 and 2017, that's an eight and five season. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, still so Kentucky's been on the cusp and last year was them finally getting over that edge um, a little bit more and finally getting where they wanted to be. The question now is, can Kentucky, after boasting, um, you know, a, a dominant power run game, um, a great offensive line, and an absolutely dominant, um, especially from a statistical standpoint, in in rushing and and in blitzing and attacking and all that, a dominant defense. Yeah, can, do they have what it takes to continue the run of form here? And let's be honest here: what is success? <clears throat> this year going to look like for the Kentucky Wildcats? I mean, let me ask, let's start off with that question in your mind, before we get into the nitty gritty of an actual team preview, and especially before we get to the end where we look at their schedule in your mind, what would success even look like for Kentucky this season? Yeah. I I mean, so like kind of going back to last year a little bit, like, like the offense, wasn't all that surprising. They leaned heavily on Benny Snell Jr. And uh, Terry Wilson was kind of that, like, good running quarterback that kind of came on late in the year throwing the ball. So, like, their offense wasn't wasn't too outside the box in yeah. terms did of what like was surprising earlier, about them. Did you like how earlier I tried to say Terry Wilson and said Tyler Wilson, and mm-hmm. you had to correct me in my own joke, and I was too embarrassed to say anything <laughs> about it till now? Um, I did not realize that was the bit. <laughs> Oh, yeah. The bit was, I'm an idiot. That was Uh, basically it. Okay. Well, let's rehearse next time. (laughs) Uh, But kind of like what you said, like the big surprise last year was that defense. Um, uh, Just just, just being honestly amazing. Um, So with with Snell leaving and uh, like there are two or three major playmakers on defense leaving. Um, I think, I think Kentucky fans coming off of a, like, like you said, like, like a program defining and record setting year for them. um, They're going to have to kind of temper their expectations. And luckily for Kentucky fans, their expectations are six wins. Yeah. So, um, you know, without getting into the schedule too much, I, I think, I think a successful season is going to be um, not not dropping below seven or six wins, um, which might be again a tough pill to swallow after after having such an amazing year. But if there's a fan base that can do it, it's Kentucky. Yeah, and I don't I don't know if it's necessarily going to come down to being like. <clears throat> You know, I, I necessarily a, a tough pe- pill peel to swallow. Tough peel. <clears throat> tough banana peel. Uh, tough banana peel. A tough pill to swallow, or if it's just kind of like, you know, a healthy understanding of um, last, how special last year was mm-hmm. and the fact that getting those seven, maybe even eight wins, if they can get seven regular season wins and win in the bowl game, you know, mm-hmm. that is still very good. And I think they understand that. Um, I think you have to understand that. I, th- I think you're absolutely right. Coming into this season, this has to be a season of, okay, we've built momentum over the past few years. It, we capitalized on momentum with a you know dream season last year, exactly the type of season that you want to have to build the foundation of a winning program. Um, <clears throat> I mean, look at Mississippi State of the past decade compared to Mississippi State of the <clears throat> early thousands you know Mm -hmm. um as soon as you just get some winning consistency it does wonders because then you become a a good destination it helps that louisville as a program has fallen apart so kentucky's hoping to capitalize on that as well um and and say okay if you're around here in the state of kentucky um you know don't 
bail on us to go over to Tennessee. Don't bail on us to go to one of the Carolinas. No, no, no. Stay in state. We actually have this football program right here that you Mm -hmm. can come and play for and be good on, you know? And I think that's a huge, and I think that's what the goal for the Wildcats this season has to be is no matter what, maintain a level of respectability as an opponent. You know, win or lose, you've got to be uh, a respectable opponent. You've got to put up a fight at all times. You've got to be able to win, you know, seven, maybe even eight games. You have to do that. So I think you're absolutely right. Like, they can't drop off much. There's going to have to be a drop off. They're losing, what, like 14 starters? Yeah. Um, So, and two of the the, the the starters starters is is a franchise defining like generational player in Benny Snell Jr. You know, I was actually going to say a, a, in Josh Allen. Um, Both I, think he was, I think he was the bigger impact player than Benny Snell. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Benny Snell. And we'll, we'll get to this in a second. Actually, you know what? We'll get to it right now. Um, on the offensive side, one of the major things that's going on here is the fact that uh, they lost Snell who of course was this like all time leading rusher in the program. Um, absolute workhorse never got tired. You could run him 40 times a game and uh, you know, his reanimated corpse at the end of the game would still be, you know, scratching out yards. Um, he's that type of guy, just a classic old school power running, running back. Um, and he's now gone, but along with him, they've lost a few offensive linemen. Um, and I think that is really huge. There's three starters gone from that offensive line. And I think that's huge as well because, I mean, as good as Benny Snell was and as, like, just um, indefatigable as he was, that's right, I broke out that word. Um, mm-hmm. He just never gets tired, right? As good as he was, uh, they still have, you know, a, a slew of running backs behind him, in particular looking at um, – AJ Rose, uh, who was the the other running back that got any significant playing time, it was a guy who averaged six point two yards per carry um, in that relief running back um, <clears throat> position. There, you know, they've got some tools there, but it's going to come down to I think a lot. I think it's going to hurt them the fact that they've lost that offensive line as well. As good as Snell was, you know, Snell also benefited greatly from an offensive line and a scheme there that really, really. Um, I think uh, was the foundation for a lot of what he did. Now, that being said, you look at his career stats, he's still boasting, you know, in his three years in college, it only took him three years to be Kentucky's all time leading rusher. Mm -hmm. And his three years, he never dropped under um, a thousand yards or under five yards per carry. So (laughs) it's just, that's, that's massive. That's huge. So uh, what do you, what do you, that you know when when you look at Kentucky's offense this year um I mean what do you see Keith um well uh, for one they need Terry Wilson to be a better quarterback like an actual quarterback um we were kind of joking around before the before we started recording um he had he had three games where he threw less less than 100 yards and one of those other games he threw for 108. Like so, that's 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 four games where you are relying uh, extremely heavily on your um, on your running back. And of course, last year when you've got Snell and you've got that good of an offensive line, you know one of the offensive linemen was a was an All American. Um, yeah. So like you can do that. Plus plus Terry Wilson runs the ball well. So. Um, you kind of have that like option run game uh, yep. that helped them out so early in the year, but the read option, the the modern foundation of the college offense. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think if I remember correctly, Wilson was like last in terms of starters in passing yards per game in the SEC. Yeah. He was, he, he was, he was 14th. Like he was, he was dead last. So um, in terms of, like you said, starters, uh, but but yeah, so um, uh, they've got they have Lynn Bowden Jr., who uh, is 
he's a good wide receiver. He's not like a game breaker or anything like that, but he's, he honestly kind of reminds me of like Van Jefferson from Florida previously from Ole Miss, just, just like a very technically sound guy um, does real well doing a lot of things, but, but doesn't really like, he's not like elite at one thing. Um, he might be elite at uh, the return game. I think that's, that's where true. he really yeah. in particular um, as a playmaker is actually in the return game more than anything else. Even though he did lead Kentucky as you know their only receiving target. <laughs> right. Yeah. It 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 was it was it was literally Wilson, uh, um, Snell, and and uh, Bowden. So, um, gosh, yeah, Bowden had sixty seven receptions. Yeah, he was. He was, he was a workhorse for a team that, that like didn't throw a whole lot. He was, like you said, he was he was their number one guy and probably their number two and number three guy. <laughs> like, like when you <laughs> go number through your one reads, with a bunch of circles drawn around it, him. Yeah, when you go through your reads, you stare down Bowden for five seconds and then you panic. Um, but 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 yeah. So, uh, and as you said, AJ Rose. <laughs> Average more than six yards of carry last year as Snell's back up. So I think they're in good hands in terms of their run game. Um, a lot's going to depend on their offensive line kind of coming together. Uh, um, yeah. They do have uh, a former five star uh, tackle that, that was lost to a knee injury last year. Um, he basically lost the entire season. So uh, they do have talent on the offensive line. Um, if that's if that's an area that they have recruited well since um, uh, Stoops got there, uh, yeah. it's been the offensive line. So yeah, um, I agree. they're going to be young, but they're going to be talented. So um, uh, I, I think that they're going to be okay on offense um, with the potential to kind of, to kind of have these, have these moments where they break out and maybe steal a game or two, you know, yeah, exactly. I mean, you're talking about, as you mentioned, that was uh, Landon Young is the offensive lineman yeah, uh, who was a big-time recruit that was out last year. They also have um, a handful of uh, former uh, Army All-American recruits mm-hmm. uh, that are are still there and as well. But you're right. it's They're mostly a very young team. I mean, even Lynn Bowden, um, who had 67 receptions um, – and uh, and here's the thing. I think that goes into what you were talking about, him not maybe necessarily being the most dynamic playmaker as a receiver, mm-hmm. is the fact that he had 67 receptions, you know, only five touchdowns. Right. Now, part of that, of course, is the fact that Terry Wilson was kind of a limited passer in general. But if you're, you know, catching the ball all the time, if you are a high-volume receiver, then you kind of are expected to be like a Percy Harvin type make a few mm-hmm. moves afterwards and make people miss and make plays that way, you know, mm-hmm. um, which is not what we see out of, out of Bowden necessarily as good as he is in the return game. He maybe is not necessarily um, creating enough uh, space from defenders as a playmaker um, to really capitalize on that. And, you know, he's going to have to be able to show that he can do that mm-hmm. this year. If they're going to, if you're going to lose a guy who rushed the ball, you know, almost 300 times last season, then yeah, I don't care how good Rose is. I don't care how good, you know, how many of like a, a litany. Cause I think they're, they're saying right now that they have like four running backs that they felt comfortable cycling through you know, like a right. real, um, they might just absolutely try to <laughs> beat the opposition into submission right. with a power run game in general. Um, but they're going to have to have something and Bowden's going to be leaned on even more this next Mm -hmm. season as a, uh, as a 67 reception player. Um, and I think that that is, uh, I don't think that's a good sign. You see, I'm a little bit more wary maybe than, um, you were about how the offense will be because I don't necessarily see, uh, Wilson, um, and Bowden being the, uh, I don't see Wilson being the guy necessarily and i feel like there's going to be too much pressure on bowden to have to be their playmaker uh so i think that that'll hurt him a little bit more on offense but at the end of the day it does come down to you know um how comfortable do they feel with that offensive line 
because if they're going to rely a lot on a running back by committee power running game, then they're going to have to really rely on that offensive line to do what they need to do. Um, and I don't know. I'm a little bit nervous about that because I feel like, yeah, I'm just a little bit nervous about that. I guess that's really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I- I think it all comes down to play calling to like kind of manage this offense a little bit better than they, you know, really needed to last year because like we said last year, they had Benny Snell Jr. and they had a really good offensive line and they had a running quarterback and a wide receiver that was that was solid. So they could kind of just lean heavily on that on that offensive line and and just push the ball down the field, you know, like like there wasn't a whole lot of explosiveness to that offense, but but it felt like they got five yards of play, which isn't exciting, but it but it but it it just it it's like quicksand. It just slowly drowns you, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. Of course okay. Yeah. No, sorry, go ahead and finish your thought. Oh no, I was I was done. Um of course one thing that we have not really mentioned yet and we f- kind of feel like we need to is that there is the question of whether uh, you know, if, if Terry Wilson um, is going to be the guy at quarterback, mm-hmm. you know, they did get, and I'm trying to remember now if, uh, before I go too deep into it, um, if Sawyer Smith is uh, eligible to play. Yeah. So Saul, yeah. So Smith is eligible. He is a graduate transfer. He's an interesting graduate transfer because he apparently has two seasons left. Um, so I guess he, uh, red shirted. Yeah, he did. So he w- played a little bit. He's a guy, he's a quarterback who ca- went to Troy, played a little bit as a true freshman, red shirted his second year. And then last year played, um, as a sophomore and actually, uh, completed, let's see, completed 63% of his passes for almost 1700 yards and 14 touchdowns. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a question there of, I mean, if Wilson struggles maybe at all and, and Kentucky recognizes their need of a spark on offense, could they pull the trigger on, uh, putting Smith out there and, uh, um, you know, giving him the reins to the team or are they going to do that dreaded because it is Mark Stoops and we know he's not above doing that, but are they going to do a dreaded two quarterback system which as the old adage goes if you have a two quarterback system you have a you know you don't have a quarterback basically you have a right. no system so uh i mean what do you think that that's i don't know do you think that affects terry wilson at all having smith there um i don't i don't really think so i i think he had a decent you know season last year that he feels like he probably has a little bit of a longer leash um uh especially because of what he did in the second half of the season as an actual passer. Um, but again, I, I think it just all comes down to like how they manage him and the play calling. Um, mm-hmm. Cause, cause if they kind of go back to how they were last year and they rely heavily on the run to start and it doesn't go as well because uh, of the aforementioned reasons and they start just trying to lean heavily on him as a, like a legit college football quarterback Mm -hmm. um passer uh it it, i don't think that's really putting him in the spot to best succeed um and then at that point you know if you start losing games early then all bets are off yeah yeah that could that could be a the most impactful situation there is just how they even start the season Mm -hmm. Uh, because you i mean you gotta know that expectations are high for a, you know, powerful, um, quick start to things. And a lot of that's going to come down to who steps up, you know, on defense, who steps up on the defensive side and whether they can jump out right out the gate and try to pummel somebody, um, with, you know, a a defense again, um, like they, like they did last year. I mean, what do they, where is their, uh, there it is. Yeah. Um, Luckily for know. them, after after two softballs, they've got just a brutal middle of the of the schedule. Yeah, yeah, they really do. Um, so that's that's the question right there. Let's talk about the defense now, um, because the offense, um, 
Well, I'll say this. I feel like the most important player for Kentucky this um, season uh, is going to be Lynn Bowden Jr. And whether he is the offensive playmaker they need to, you know, bring some a little bit of a more, a little bit more dimension to a power running focused offense. So Mm -hmm. that's who I think is going to be their most important player. Um, Who do you think is going to be on offense at least their their most important guy? Um, uh, I don't see how it can't be Wilson. Like, Mm -hmm. just just because uh, I mean, like like the quarterback usually is one of, if not the most important player on the offense, and like they're they're the pivot. But you know, with a young offensive line, with a guy coming in who is now going to carry the entire load, um, we you know we would imagine in in AJ Rose, like he's, he's, he, he's suddenly that offensive leader, you know? Um, and if they can't find a way to have him succeed, I don't think that the offense succeeds. Yep. Yep. Totally get that. All right, let's shift gears, go to the defense real quick. A defense that, uh, lost seven starters. That's and in particular, easy. Yeah, it, it hurts. And in particular, it seems like every player they lost uh, like was one of their impact guys. Like the only returners, they're like, oh, well, maybe we can lean heavily on our returners. Their returners were not the notable names in that defense, um, which puts a lot of pressure on them to step up. You know, um, they, are, they were a defense that ranked sixth nationally in points allowed per game. Um and uh, as mentioned before, with a player like Josh Allen has just an incredible pass rush, which puts a lot of pressure and causes other teams to make mistake. Um, but uh, they've got, um, I mean, a lot of secondary players that are that are gone now. A lot of their outside rushers are gone now. They're really only returning some interior linemen, interior linebackers, mm-hmm. and that's about it. Uh, let's talk about this defense a little bit here. Um how big of a step back do you think Kentucky can expect this season, having lost uh, Josh Allen and so much of their defensive players that were so productive? Yeah, I, I think, unsurprisingly, this is going to be where they struggle the most this year. Um, because, like you said, like they they were a, an extremely stingy defense last year. Um, again, like – maybe the best defense they've ever had in program history, um, you know, full of future NFL players led by Josh Allen, who uh, was a personal favorite because he was basically just a WWE star. Um, <laughs> I think I, I couldn't even be mad after the Florida loss. Um, well, I guess Florida win if we're talking from the perspective of Kentucky, but sure. Sure. After After the loss to Kentucky, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, After, after that game, he, he was kind of walking out on the field and took two of those little small Gatorade bottles and smashed them together and drank them both at the same time, just like stone gold uh, Steve Austin. So that instantly kind of washed away all of the despair from, from losing to a team for the first time since I was like eight. Um, So, uh, but but yeah, like as far as like on on the field production, um, they they lost basically most of their secondary. They lost a lot of their uh, you know outside guys, uh, and that was that was the strength of their defense was was their incredible pass rush and their and their rangy DBs, um, and, and 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 so like a lot of that's gone. They're gonna have to. Um, rely a lot on their 2019 class, which is never a mm-hmm. good thing. Um, I know that that they're basically wide open at the defensive back position. And so they're they're gonna be starting some 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 true freshman players on the outside. And um I know that they got some talented players back there, but that's 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 a hard ask to come in and start against, you know, these SEC's quarterbacks, um, yep. Without, without these these like big stars on the edge rushing up and uh, and uh, 
you know, kind of shortening that time that quarterbacks have to have have to throw the ball. So um, uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see kind of how good this this defense is this year. Um, I don't know, man. It's it's going to be rough. I think. Yeah i I wonder a little bit. Um, you know, I think. I think that recruiting like rankings are largely hogwash Mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, I'm pretty open about that. Um, Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter to me as much like the, the amount of stars that you're getting. Mm -hmm. What matters to me is, uh, you know, are you addressing the needs? And clearly they, this is what's interesting to me is that they obviously knew they needed um, outside linebackers and defensive backs. Um, But I just don't – like, they went and recruited six DBs and five outside linebackers in the most recent signing class. Yeah. Like, like they knew that they were losing a lot of guys back there, so they went out and just – like, they went shopping, you know? They did. It's just like, you know, if you know you're about to have several guys who are, you know, uh, graduating, you know, aging out of the program, all that sort of stuff, like, how are you not going harder after those guys earlier on, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's the what the one thing I look at that you know I kind of wonder about a little bit is did you do yourself a disservice by not having um you know more of a focus on linebackers and safeties 2 years ago you know to right. give them a full year in the in the program maybe uh a redshirt season or something like that you know you go back to their their 2018 recruiting class Um, And it's got a handful of offensive linemen. So they, you know, did right there. As you mentioned, Stoops, you know, I think Stoops is is smart enough to understand you win college football games uh, at the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he goes after that. But, uh, I mean, maybe I'm I'm looking at maybe two, three, two secondary players, maybe one outside linebacker in the 2018 class. Yeah, that's not Uh, good. Yeah, 2017 class has a, a bunch of athletes <laughs> who I believe all ended up being uh, wide receivers, including Lynn Bowden. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I see one corner, one safety. There's another corner. So a few guys that came out of that. Okay, three corners, one safety. So four guys in the 2017 class. That's good. But still, you know, if all of a sudden you you go hard after these positions, like right now it raises a question of like, okay, are these guys good enough to be instant contributors? Because chances are they're going to have to be. Yeah. Um, Even if you're, even if you're just thin, chances are that, uh, um, somebody's going to get hurt, you know, something like that could easily happen. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you can't go through recruiting cycles by, by, by making up, you know, like, like going shopping for, for your expiring players basically the year before and expect to be, you know, to like maintain any actual level of success because like we're seeing with them, they, they pretty much just disregarded like, like rushing and outside players um, for two years. So, so in 17 and 18, they recruited, what was it? Six or seven DBs and like, outside linebackers and and then this class they have six of one and five of the other like like that's not that's not a recipe to have no a consistent successful yeah yeah and and but but like what does help is is that they got two juco transfers at at cornerbacks so that at least gives them a little bit of experience um, to kind of maybe hopefully if they stay healthy to provide a little bit of a, of a buffer, because let's be honest, like, unless you're, you know, like, like a true all-star type cornerback, you're not going to be out there the whole game, you know, they right. like to shuffle you in and out based on situations, based on, you know, just how the game's going. Um, cause you know, football is a 60 minute game and, 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 you get you get really tired out there just chasing people around the field. So, um, so, so those two JUCO transfers help, but you know, like if those two go down to injury or they don't pan out, like suddenly you're you're shoving true freshmen out there 
Yeah. And, um, it's not great. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to look and see. Uh, it's always just kind of difficult to get a, a good, like, clean roster <laughs> to look at and figure really out. Is. Yeah. Especially now, because, like, sometimes, like, they show last year's roster, and then when you, you right. know, like, it's never exactly what you need. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we bragged a lot about um, last year when it came to Kentucky is just the uh, insane um, size that they boasted in the secondary. Yeah. I think that that helped them out a huge amount um, in that they had uh, maybe guys that weren't the best, you know, coverage guys, but like had enough going on in terms of length, uh, in yeah. terms of just like, you know, like, size in general that they were able to cover up some they of were the. All like the, six foot three and like 210 pounds. Like, like they were yeah. monsters. Yeah, exactly. So I'm looking at it now and I do see it. I mean, their secondary, the returning guys that they have, there's a, you know, uh, I think there's a couple of guys that are in the 6'1", 6'2", range um, as far as returning guys. But a lot of dudes in here in the secondary are, you know, almost entirely freshmen or redshirt freshmen. I'm looking at, I see one, two, three, uh, four, five, six. Yeah, so six freshman or redshirt freshman in the secondary for Kentucky. Um, and if that, so if that pass rush doesn't end up being what it needs to be, um, that's going to really, really put too much pressure on the secondary players. Um, and even then, I mean, once you get past that, they've got two juniors, three juniors, two, so three juniors and then like t- one or two sophomores, no seniors. Um, so it's all so young. It's just scary young in that secondary. Yeah. Um, and then, even with guys like Quandre Mosley, who is one of their returning 6'2 <laughs> mm-hmm, uh, right. defensive backs. Yeah. yeah. It, it, good thing for them, though, that their freshmen that are coming in are all like 6'1 or 6'2. So um, there seems to be a trend there. Like, like they're only going to fill out more and get taller. So, um, also seen a lot of guys from Florida, so they seem to be recruiting a lot better there than than they have in the past. Um, I guess that's what happens when you win ten games. You know? Yeah, it helps. People you know, like, I'm who knew? For you. <laughs> who knew? Who knew winning games was uh, was crucial to success as a program? <laughs> right. All right. So the big question that remains, though, here uh, with the Kentucky Wildcats is: I'll look at their schedule and. Uh, a look at what can be expected um, from them in terms of win, loss, that sort of thing. So their schedule is as follows. They open up the season with two MAC opponents at home, Toledo and then Eastern Michigan. Uh, you never want to overlook the Maction that happens when teams Damn. like that come to town. Maction Jackson. Maction Jackson. They have a, another home game. It's interesting that they don't have like a – a non-major opener or something like that. I'm noticing more teams getting away from that trend Mm -hmm. um, and instead having more non-major games later in the year as like a quasi bye week if you will. Right. Um, Like, uh, I'm just noticing that even with like, you know, I don't know, I've noticed it with other teams. So, uh, Florida comes to uh, prestigious Kroger Field the third week of the season um, to start off, with, as you pointed out, is a pretty rough middle of the or early season stretch here. Um, they have to travel to Mississippi State, a program that most likely wants revenge from a 28-7 drubbing last season. They have to travel to South Carolina, a program that wants to reestablish themselves as a Eastern contender. They have Arkansas at home, so, you know, could practically be a bye week. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> then they have to go to Georgia. So there's that rough uh, top of top of the East con- competition there. Um, Missouri's at home, Tennessee's at home, and then they go to Vanderbilt. Then they have their non-major game, ten- UT Martin, and end the season, of course, against in-state rival Louisville. So another you know, non-major. 
Yeah, another non-major, <laughs> non-major at this point. So, I mean, it, it doesn't look to me to be the, the most difficult schedule in the world, so that goes in their favor, but there is a pretty rough stretch in there. What's your assessment of this rec, uh, season here, schedule here? That's that's the word. Yeah. Um, I, I think that they've got, I think I counted it earlier, like, like, like five wins that they can basically bank on. That's their two openers. They're uh, versus Toledo and versus uh, – Eastern Michigan, and then you got Arkansas, who is just going to be rough this year again. And then mm-hmm. you close out with UT Martin and Louisville. Um, I can't imagine Louisville being much worse than they were last year, but I also don't think they're going to be a whole lot better. So, um, you know, status quo for the win. Uh, but 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 then you got these 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 games towards the end of the year that are, that are, that are very easily kind of, kind of swing games uh, based on uh, history and based on just kind of what, what their talent level is going to be this year Mm -hmm. as well as Kentucky's. So um, really like your last five games are going to be up in the air a little bit. You've got Mizzou at home and Tennessee at home and, um, you know, having those games at home is a huge deal. Um, you know, Kroger Field is a is a black hole. Of, it's a fortress. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> we've 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 somehow managed to talk about Kroger Field on these previews like six times. I know, um, I love it. It's 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 hilarious. But but it's our new favorite stadium. It just yeah, is. Um, the, the Kroger Field's the official favorite stadium of running out the clock. Yeah, I'm moving there. Um, not to Lexington, to Kroger yeah, Field. To, yeah, I'm living in the press box. Um, <laughs> but but so you've got Mizzou at home and Tennessee at home, and then you go to Vanderbilt. And um, <clears throat> you know, Van, Vandy was decent last year, uh, but I don't think they're going to be as good as they were last year, and they weren't great last year. So. Um, I mean, those those are three games right there that that I think that Kentucky has a shot at winning, um, but they could also very easily lose all three of those games. So yeah, like like that's going to kind of be their season. Is they're going to more than likely beat Toledo and Eastern Michigan. They're probably going to lose to Florida and State, um, South Carolina. I, I don't really know how I feel about South Carolina, even though we talked about them for almost an hour. Like, right. Um, That's because they're just a confusing team, man. They are. Like, like you're like, oh, man, they got all these players. They're going to be so good. And then they win five games. Yeah. And then you're like, I don't really know how they're going to do. And then they win like eight. So, yep. you know, and then of course, Ar- Arkansas is Arkansas. George is, is, is about as sure bet loss as you're going to have on here. Yeah. Um, and then there's Which is, the, the, that's games. interesting, though, that you're, you're really talking about a schedule in the SEC where, I mean, Probably you look at it and only two of them, which you consider to be sure bet losses in Mm -hmm. Georgia and Florida. Right. Um, And even then, you never know, because we would have said the same thing about Florida last season against Kentucky. You know, Um, it was one of the awful. (laughs) Yeah. One of the the quotes, I believe, uh, um, Mark Stoops uh, had about like the the youngsters in the recruiting class right now um, and how many people they um they lost coming out of this season. Mm -hmm. Uh, He said something on the lines of like, uh, I mean, we're just talking about what you're saying about, man, can these guys step up and replace, um, you know, the, who it is that we lost. It's like, that's what, you know, they're replacing guys that you said the same things about when they started playing at Kentucky. Like, do they have what it takes? You know, Um, he's like, so that's, that's an important thing. Like this is, it's kind of fun to have a, no expectations in the program because people are just going to assume that you're not going to do well and you have a chance to just say, okay, we're going to prove everyone wrong. Yep. And you can't really discount that because now, you know, they've got a little bit of swagger. Um, Yep. But like, you're also going to like, you've got two teams in the first month of the season that you embarrassed last year. Like they're not going to forget that. No. Um, You know, you beat Florida for the first time, like in Gainesville, and you 
you beat a ranked state team that that kind of feels like they were you know done dirty in that game um mm-hmm. and it was just an ugly game so and you're going to Starkville, which is a, a, a tough place to play anyway um that's just you know i don't i don't see how they come out of those two games with a win honestly but yeah um but then you know like you've got south carolina so like who knows or arkansas so like they could be four and two going into the georgia game and then at, after Georgia, like I said earlier, there's those five games that you, you that that are honestly just wide open for them. So, give us an estimate then on how you think they actually perform this season. Um, I I think their floor is five wins. I think their ceiling is nine. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, so. I don't know. I, I could see him. I could see him going, going, going seven wins. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I but think they're, that's, that's like if everything goes well, you know, sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. I, I think that their ceiling is really only, uh, eight wins this year. I mm-hmm. think there's just too much going on with that defense and the youth there. Yeah. Um, to, to, I think that's the best case, uh, looking at, you know, Toledo, Eastern Michigan, uh, Arkansas, and then those five games to end the season that, as you Mm -hmm. pointed out, are all winnable, Missouri, Tennessee, Vanderbilt, UT Martin and Louisville, they're all winnable. Um, but I, I just don't know, you know, they're going to have to prove a lot leading into, uh, that, that final stretch. Cause they have to, they start off, you know, with promising, um, opposition in Toledo and Eastern Michigan. They have that rough stretch. They have to prove that they learned enough through that rough stretch to come back and, uh, you know, perform at the level that that they are expect of themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's the thing about it is that there's just when you've got that much youth um, on your squad, like they do. I really think we could be talking about a better Kentucky team next season. Um, maybe not right now. I think this might be um, a season they take a step back a little bit, but I still think that um, still think we're looking at a Kentucky team that goes bowling. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think if they that, take care of the games that they they should, but I just don't. I don't necessarily see their uh, their ceiling being any higher than eight tops. Sure. So, all right. I believe that is it now that is going to wrap up this Kentucky Wildcat preview. Keith, any uh, closing statements you want to make? Uh, I don't think so. That's all, all I right. got. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. That's it then. I'm just kidding. Uh, th- <laughs> thank you for tuning into this. Uh, episode of Running Out the Clock. Uh, if you've been keeping up with our preview episodes, then you might have noticed that we ended up skipping LSU. That was not really on purpose. That was entirely because we were really busy and it just kind of didn't happen due to conflicting uh, schedules going on right now. We will try to remedy that before the start of the season, obviously, but that LSU episode might be coming out at like the same time we do our full season mm-hmm. <laughs> episode. So, who knows? But uh, stay tuned because after this, I mean, uh, who else do we even have left to talk about? Probably nobody, right? Nobody important for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, pay uh, pay attention. Nope. Stay tuned. That's what I was going to say because coming up, we no. have yep our final round of previews before we get into the actual season discussion, which is what is going to get really, really exciting, probably. Yeah. Keith, thank you for jumping in on this episode. Listener, thank you for tuning in. I'm your friend, Joseph Craven. Keith, sign us out. Y'all have a good night, you hear? <laughs>